Good afternoon, everyone, and uh, I hope you've had a good day so far, but uh, we're going to continue this study on the lines simply presented, and we're going to sort of go back a little bit and address some, some points and see how far we get today. But before we begin, can you join us in a word of prayer? <clears throat> Dear gracious Heavenly Father, we are thankful for the time that we have to study this afternoon, and we ask for your Holy Spirit uh, to be here as uh, we open your word together. May you speak to our hearts, and may those who are seeking for truth um, be able to see clearly the things that we present. Help us to understand these things. We ask that you can correct us in any errors we may have in our thinking. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. <clears throat> Okay, so um, when we look at Isaiah 28, and we've looked at this a few times, dealing with uh, the idea of line upon line, precept upon precept, here little and there little. Um, we know that this, uh, well, precept upon precept, precept upon precept. So there's this in verse 10, for instance. Um, it's going to double the precept is doubled, and then it's doubled again. Now, why is this? So if you can see the verse here. Why, why does it go precept upon precept, precept upon precept, line upon line, line upon line? Why, why doesn't it just say precept upon precept, line upon line, here little, there little, or something like that? Why, why does it double these doublings? Any ideas about this? I would think it's making it emphatic. It's okay. saying it's, it's like establishing that that is a method to use. Right. So in Hebrew, they, they double things when it's emphatic. Right. Even something like three days and three nights or 40 days and 40 nights. Um, these, these are a type of... Uh, way of stressing or emphasizing something um, like we don't take three days and three nights, for instance, is literally 72 hours um, because it's, it's a Hebrew expression. And so to take something in, it's sort of a type of intensification, but it's, it's emphatic. It, it's um, uh, what's the word for it. I can't think of the other word, but you know, like if I say, in dying ye shall die, ye shall surely die. I mean, that's um, when you put that surely, the lee at the end. What, what's they call it when they put that ending on a word? It's an adverb. Yeah, it's an adverb, but, you know, um, yeah. So I'm trying to think. There's some other phrase, but anyway, it, it's, it makes it emphatic, right? So um, uh, I guess like mostly and uh, oh. and sometimes I can't remember, you know, high school grammar. But anyway, um, so when we have this, we have this, this, this is emphatic, but also we, we see that there is this, this layering precept upon precept. And then precept upon precept. So this means to set in order, right? The idea of a precept, when we looked at the word precept in Hebrew, it the word itself is like a teaching, uh, something that's used in instruction. It's a, it's a principle. Um, and so an injunction, a command, a precept. But it comes from a word, uh, tzava. So the word is tzav there, but tzava um, that means to constitute and join a point, uh, send a message, put or set in order, right? So the idea is, if you think about what a precept is, a teaching, a command, an ordinance, an oracle, it's something that is, um, and I need to just go to six zero. Um, Right. So if we look here at uh, 
Brown Drivers Briggs. And we look at this word, to command charge, give orders, lay charge, give charge, uh, to order, to lay charge upon, to give charge to, give command to, right? Um, and, and, and so these are injunctions. These are commands. So go, what is God doing if the, we have this as um, a... Uh, a word that is is being um, emphasized in this way is, I mean, obviously this is not a, a suggestion. I guess we can put it that way. And this, that's why the King James adds, it must be, for precept must be upon precept, precept upon precept. Does that make sense? This is this is not some suggestion. That we are, are basically commanded to do this, to look at things line upon line. Now we know that the word line, kav, this word here is a chord line, a measuring line. Um, and so the whole idea of this is to, uh, and, and even the word itself, it means, the root word means that kava, means to bind together, perhaps by twisting, that is to collect figuratively, to expect, to gather together, to look patiently, to tarry or wait for upon. So we're measuring the time because this, this is a command that God is asking us to do, to measure the time. And if we're looking for waiting or tarrying, does this not mean that it's time in the future? So when we take this line, is it's not just a line of events in the past. We're not just looking at lines in the past. We're looking at lines in the future. And, and then the sense of here a little, so uh, ziar means a little, um, so it's just something that means little, but the word here, and it's the same word in Hebrew uh, for here and there, that is Hebrew doesn't have a this or that, um, or here or there, or these or those, um, just has the same word. And so they just don't have that. Uh, that idea in the Hebrew language isn't really directly expressed. Now, the idea of there, it's a primitive particle rather than from the relative, which is another word, uh, eight, three, four, whatever word that is, but it's there, transferred to time, then. So it can refer to a location, but it also can refer to time as well. So either thither or thence, right? So whether that's time or not. So, so what we've been doing in these lines is we've been, we've been ordering them. Now, now this is a simple study on the lines, or the lines simply presented. Doesn't mean it's really that simple, but we're leaving out a lot of material um, so that people can get a sense of how these lines work. And it's difficult because I don't know all of the the people who are watching these videos and how much they understand or how much they don't understand. Um, but we have done, uh, you know, 290 presentations on understanding the lines, one and a half hour presentations. And I don't expect that people are going to go through all of those presentations if they've just started studying these things. Um, but this idea that we can set these things upon a line this is in response to the drunkards of Ephraim, right? So we know that there is a way of studying that is just a regurgitation, and it causes people to stumble in judgment and err in vision. And so people are just repeating things that they've heard, but they're not following Miller's rules. And, and in this line of, of things is, 
is all the stuff that we get on the internet that we just, we hear about, you know, we see memes and we just sort of believe things and repeat things that we've heard. We have no real understanding of these things at all. And so if we're going to have an understanding of the time that we're in, we need to study in this way. I mean, this is absolutely essential because we can't know everything. No matter how much you try to know, there are too many things and there's too much information and too much misinformation for us to sort through all of, all of what we hear and see around us. But we have God's word and God's word has told us that we can examine history and the time that we're living in, in this manner, by precept upon precept, line upon line, and here little and there little. And, and this is in connection also with the Sunday law. Now we know that this, that God is asking us to study this way. But to those who do not study this way, the word of the Lord will be to them precept upon precept, line upon line, because they're going to be part of those lines whether they want to be or not. But they'll be on the bad side of those lines. Right? And that's how I understand Isaiah 28, 13. But the word of the Lord was unto them, precept upon precept, precept upon precept, line upon line, line upon line, here a little and there a little, that they might go and fall backward and be broken and snared and taken. How many, uh, now we have here that they might go, now whether that, that go is like means to walk, to fall backward, that's two, to be broken, that's three, to be snared, that's four, and taken. Is this representing the foolish virgins, the five foolish? Yes, I think so. Yeah. And we know that this is about the Sunday law because we're, we're told about this covenant with death. So there's this message then given to us, wherefore hear the word of the Lord, ye scornful men that rule this people, which is in Jerusalem, because ye have said, we have made a covenant with death, and with hell we are at agreement. When the overflowing scourge shall pass through, it shall not come unto us, for we have made lies our refuge, and under falsehood have we hid ourselves. Right? So these this represents those who... You know, they're not literally literally recognizing that they're making a covenant with death, but that's what they are doing by compromising with the world. And they believe that when they compromise with the world, that they are going to be able to survive the Sunday law. But this happens in lots of different ways. It doesn't just happen, you know, with the church and their compromises with ecumenism. This is all kinds of worldly thinking, all kinds of of ideas you know watching all the different videos that are out there um you know about the vaccine and all these types of things we're filling our minds with something that's going to lead us astray if it's not based upon line upon line and then uh, it says god says therefore thus saith the lord god behold i lay in zion for a foundation a stone, a tried stone, a precious cornerstone, a sure foundation. He that believeth shall not make haste. So we know that in, in our understanding of studying the lines, the first thing we did before we did understanding the line series, we did um, examining the foundation. And so we need to understand the foundation of this message. And then it says, judgment will I also will I lay to the line. So that's the same word, kav. And righteousness to the plummet. The plummet, of course, is the way marks on a line. And hail shall sweep away the refuge of lies and water shall overflow the hiding place. This is the Sunday law. These are the events at the end of the world. And your covenant with death shall be disannulled and your agreement with hell shall not stand. When the overflowing scourge shall pass through, then ye shall be trodden down by it. So there's no safety from the Sunday law. 
in clinging to the ideas and the teachings and the understanding of the world. From the time that it goeth forth, it shall take you. For morning by morning, it shall pass over by day and by night, and it shall be a vexation only to understand of the report. Um, now, it's kind of interesting here. I've never really thought about this one too much. But morning by morning, it shall it pass over. By day and by night, it shall be a vexation. So we have two different expressions. So when we think about morning by morning, that's a whole day, right? From morning to morning, that's the daytime. Um, but then it says by day, right? So that's Yom. And by night, Lila. Right, so you got these these ideas, but you really have four different uh, points: the morning of the of one day to the morning of the next day, but also the night and the day. So if we go morning, if I go from one morning to the next morning, that's going to be, of course, the night time. But I can continue to go morning by morning. And, and by day and by night. So why why does the, why is this expression brought here? Morning by morning shall it pass over. By day and by night it shall be a vexation. Only to understand the report. So what what is this referencing? What it brings to mind to me is the contrast between the verse in Lamentations 3 about the Lord Lord have, having mercy on us morning by morning, right? Each day his love for us is renewed. However, there's no escape from the Sunday law, the persecution from all the affairs of this world. When, mm -hmm. when that law is passed and it's implemented, there is no escape from it except there's a refuge in him. Okay. Yeah, and, and we have this this doubling here happening again, you know. And if you think, if you go from one morning to the next, you're going to go through day and through night to get to the next morning, right? That's a 24-hour period. You're going to have a day and a night if you go from one morning to the next. Um, but this is, is also in relation to time. Um, so from the time that it goeth forth, of course, it uses a word there, but that doesn't relate to time. But um, that when it goeth forth, it shall take you, for morning by morning shall it pass over. So this is talking about the overflowing scourge, the Sunday law. So this is something that um, that we need to understand. What this is talking about now it's going to say for the bed is shorter than that a man can stretch himself on it and the covering narrower than he can wrap himself so this is a verse i've known since i was a child i always was fascinated by this verse um so the bed is shorter than a man can stretch himself the covering narrower and that he can wrap himself. So there is no safety. There's no comfort. For the Lord shall rise up as in Mount Perizim, and he shall be wroth as in the valley of Gibeah, that he may do his work, his strange work, and bring to pass his act, his strange act. So these are the end, events at the end of the world. Now, therefore, be ye mockers, lest your bands be made strong, for I have heard from the Lord God of hosts a consumption, even determined the, upon the whole earth. And um, it's going to deal with all of these things that we're not going to look into, uh, the wheat and the grain, the fitches, and so forth. We know we have this line upon line. So in looking at this, 
and, and I'm trying to stress this, I'm trying to, uh, to help us understand what this is. So we're gonna look at um, some lines. And we're gonna look at um, three different lines. One which is um, 1798, so this is Millerite history. This is you know, well established, the 1260, the 2520 for Northern Israel in its two different aspects of it. That's going to end in 1798, the period of darkness, February 15, 1798, when the Pope is taken captive. And then we have the formalization of that method, message, September 14th, 1833. That's when Miller receives his credentials, though he, Stephen, there's more about when he receives his credentials than just that date, correct? Well, he wasn't there. Right. When he, uh, that meeting was taking place. Mm -hmm. So I don't know when he actually heard about it exactly. I know that he had heard about it by the 16th because he then writes a letter okay. uh, to his sister saying he has these credentials. Okay. Yeah, so, and, and there are other things that we could look at here in, because Miller has his own line as well. Um, but then the date that we're all familiar with, August 11th, 1840, this date, of course, is the end of the second woe. And from that day to October 22, 1844, is 1,533 days. Now, this is, of course, um, a reference to this wonderful manifestation of the power of God from 1840 to 44, and also which Ellen White compares with the Exodus, the events of the Exodus, which occur in 1533 B.C., and then, of course, we have um, the, 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 the arrival of the second angel, April 19th, 1844, midnight, July 21st, and the midnight cry, August 15th, with October 22, 1844, being the arrival of the third angel's message. <clears throat> so this is fairly standard in, in this movement in understanding these lines, but there is a lot more to these lines than we, we see on the surface here. So we know that there's Samuel Snow's letters. Um, there is our lack of understanding regarding uh, the events at Boston and Exeter, where we sort of have conflated them. And for most Adventists, of course, they don't know about Boston. Um, and then, of course, this whole line that we have from the first day of the first month to the 10th day of the seventh month, and its connection to lines that go into our history, these are not illustrated here. But we do know that that time of the end in 1798 is Daniel 11, uh, or verse 40b, and the time of the end below it on November 9th, 1989, is Daniel 11, verse 40b. So you have the first part of Daniel 11, verse 40, and then the second part of Daniel 11, verse 40. And they're going to be referencing um, the time of the end. So there are two times of the ends. But our time of the end is a repeat of Millerite history. It is what happened in 1798 um, with this conflict between the king of the north and the king of the south. The second part of that, where the king of the north comes against the king of the south, that's repeated in 1989. And that's going to begin this period of time that leads directly to the Sunday law. And that's what this movement has been about. We've understood um, in Jeff, Jeff Pippinger, understanding these lines back in 1989, begins this study of the repeat of Millerite history. It's formalized with the publication of the Time in the End magazine in 1996. And then... Um, his message is empowered at, on September 11th by an event that he's not actually looking for. And originally he had lined up 1989 with August 11th, 1840, but now he's going to move that alignment there so that the empowerment of the first angel 
is September 11th. That lines up with August 11th, 1844, or 1840, pardon me. And then um, April 19th, 1844, which is the arrival of the second angel. That wasn't initially how Jeff even looked at Millerite history. He would have looked at 1842 when the Protestants begin to close the doors to the Millerites. The Millerites then are going to have to have camp meetings. So um, when we look then at 9-11 as the arrival of the second angel, uh, we have this problem in this message where we have 9-11 representing two events. And so Jeff brought those two together. He joined those two events together so that 9-11 serves two purposes. Now, we saw in another study that we could just flip <coughs> the second 9-11, and we could create a new line, which was 11-9. And that's what we understand now is that this line 9-11, that's the arrival of the second angel, is really just a separate line that is 9-11 um, isn't really on the same line in two different way marks. We have zoomed in and we have seen this arrival of the second angel, but that's because we're on a separate line. And that line has to do with our history presently. So, so when we look at, at this line here, which we, which we now know is really two separate lines mixed together. And we know also that, uh, which we don't show here, and we're, we, we did it before, where we, the third angel arrives October 22nd, 1844. The next thing is the Sunday law. And we have just taken a repeat of history and sort of tacked it onto that line of events that occur before the Sunday law. But initially, we had the midnight cry paralleling the loud cry, and we know the loud cry comes after the Sunday law. So, so now we can separate out those lines more clearly. We can see that what we're doing is we're zooming into a way mark. Now, in our morning studies, we've been doing this extensively in the Book of Judges for the last number of months. Um, and, and that's one of the things that we began to see when we... Uh, began studying these lines, understanding the lines, back in uh, December 26, 2021, we started to see how these lines were actually working, and we didn't fully understand it before. Now, what we have below that, the third line, uh, this line here uh, is and it's probably not a correct line necessarily in, in the sense of, um, I shouldn't say it's not correct, but it's not, it, it's a minor line. It's a specific line that addresses uh, time setting in this movement. We have some similar lines in the book of Judges, but in this line, we have a time of the end, which is going to be uh, 2014. And that's going to be the 126 shekels and the 151 uh, shekels, depending on how you count the shekels in um, the Mini Mini Tekel Upharsin in Daniel chapter 5, when Belshazzar uh, has Daniel interpret the writing on the wall. But here we had Parminder who made a prediction regarding 2014. So he has this 2014 date. And then it's going to unfold with these different dates. Uh, the formalization of that message is February 27th, 2016. Now, whether this is correct or not, um, anybody know what that date is, February 27th, 2016? Why I put it there? This was another study we had done before. That's Sir Minder. 
Okay, so what's particularly about Parminder that happens there? Ordination. I believe it's his ordination. That's what I remember it to be. Um, so, so he's going to be ordained along with Tavolo and Marco. Um, on February 27, 2016. So, so this is a message of time that is... Uh, that Parminder is going to be introducing into this movement. It's a period of darkness. But when 2014 arrives and we have all this division that happens, this opens the door for Parminder to then... So, so this line here is, in some ways, it's Parminder's line of time. Um, and in some ways, it's the false time setting, but it's mixed with the true. So then Parminder is ordained, and then we're going to have two 9-11 prayers. One in on June 2nd, 2017. These are both in Italy. Uh, but that one's actually at 9-11 when the sun sets at 9-11. And Jeff is going to be uh, opening the Sabbath. And unbeknownst to him, it's also Pentecost that's ending. And we're going to say that's the empowerment of Parminder's message. Now, um, in 2017, they're going to have organization that's going to happen later on. But here we have an introduction of time into the message uh, by Parminder. And, and why does this 9-11 prayer, why does it uh, empower Parminder's message of time? How is this vindicating, to some degree, the time setting of Parminder? Well, I was not there. All I can guess is that because Jeff didn't confront it and try to do away with it then. Well, okay. So when he when Jeff kneels down at nine eleven right, to offer this prayer, unbeknownst to him. Now, there was also this thing about 120 minutes, which I think was probably an hour and 20 minutes, but it still has a symbol of 120. Um, uh, people actually tried to obscure what was happening there. They didn't like uh, later on, once uh, I had brought out this truth, people tried to obscure it and sort of deny that it happened. But it doesn't even really matter. Uh, because it's all you already have Pentecost there anyway for the 120 as a symbol. But um, <clears throat> uh, here we have this 9 11, and it's going to happen again. Now, Jeff was talking about 9 11 in his two presentations that he did. So now we're going to have a 9 11 again one year later, one year and seven days later on June 9th. And Jeff is going to close the Sabbath at 9-11. So this is going to be uh, the start of that day. So that day, the next day, June 10th, Parminder is going to present time setting to this movement. And we know that um, Daniel from Brazil accounts 126 days from that event and uh, predicts that the message will be given in the United States. Uh, the one foot on the sea, or one foot on the land, uh, the sea being Europe, the land being the United States. And October 13th, 2018, he predicts that that's going to happen. He does that on July 27th, and Samuel Snow's letters all show up in there. Um, but we have the second angel arrive uh, with this time-setting message. And that's going to be formalized on October 3rd with Tess giving this date of November 9th. So now we, the movement is officially given a date. Now, Stephen had understood November 9th, 2019, prior to hearing anything that Tess had presented. And I also had presented some dates, uh, particularly April 8th, um, 2019, for the betrayal of 
of Christ by Judas. And, and then later, of course, after November, after October 13th, we're going to have uh, the July 18, 2020 date. But we have this formalization of the message with Tess's presentation, and then it's empowered. That is, I give witness to this 300, to November 9th, 2019, by this 391.5 days. Now, this is going to be rejected by Tess, uh, as well as the 126 days of uh, Daniel from Brazil, and, and all of the other information that vindicates her message. So Tess doesn't want anyone else to be having light. She is the source of light. She is the prophet. And um, this line represents this false time setting, even though it's witnessed to by, by truth. That is, this time setting is based upon a dispensational idea of time. So, so when we look at these lines, we know that this is about the coming Sunday law. We, we're, we're looking at these lines of judgment, and we have these, uh, uh, so that's the, the measuring line of judgment. And then we have these way marks, which are the plummet, that are, are way marks of righteousness, right? These are righteousness. But we can see that even in some of these way marks, uh, you can have counterfeit lines or lines that um, where way marks are shown, but there is, um, uh, uh, you know, that this is a false message of time, but yet we are measuring it and we are witnessing to these events, right? By putting them on a line, we now can see that they form part of a structure. Now, why is this important? Why is this structure important? Can't I just, you know, measure some spans between dates and doesn't that tell me anything? Why do we need a structure? Well, you just can't come up with a date. You have to have it um, supported by something, don't you? Right. So, so these are point supported by line upon line, right? <laughs> you know, we could, you know, just measure the time. You know, we could, we could just say, oh, oh here's from this date to this date is twelve hundred and sixty days, and so this date was important. So that date in the future, that's twelve hundred and sixty days away, it's going to be important. Right. People do this all the time. Uh, not just in other churches, but in this movement, I get constantly people giving me dates and speculations about dates, but they have no structure for those dates. They don't have a period of darkness. They don't have um, light, you know, and how that light is increased. They don't have something that ties these lines together. So they're not putting precept upon precept, line upon line. Right? They're just, they're just picking dates. And you can find even dates that have happened in the past um, that they can be connected by a certain number of days with another line. And you could just argue, well, that's significant. But, but the question is, are those dates connected? Are they part of a structure? You know, when we looked at things um, in some of our other studies in the past, you know, even things like the atomic bomb, there is structure there. They're connected to other histories. So we don't just throw dates out, you know, and say, oh, you know, this date in the future, it's going to be this many days away. So, you know, that's going to be some way mark. We don't know. Often we put dates in the future when we have done that. They haven't actually shown up on the lines. Uh, but we have when we've had these structures, and especially when we were studying the book of Judges, that we saw consistently the same line showing up again and again. He's over, zooming into a way mark, we can create a new line. Now, um, <clears throat> now, when we look at this line here, 
So remember, we have these two 9-11s. But these two 9-11s are not the same. And we, we took one of these 9-11s and we just flipped it around and went like this, 11-9, right? Now, that, of course, is November 9th, 2019. And we should be able to see then that this line below is actually just a zoom into this way mark. Now, it's true, September 11th is the arrival of the second angel's message. So when I do this, and I put November 9th there, I'm not denying the other line, but I need to recognize that that other line is is not the same line that has 9-11 as the empowerment of the first angel. So if I have a line that where 9-11 is the empowerment of the first angel, what am I doing when I put 11-9 as the arrival of the second? Because we, because we know these are both really the same way, Mark, but on different lines, if that makes sense. See, we have these two 9-11s below. And these two 9-11s are going to witness to November 9th, 2019. So I want people to think about, about this. Um, you know, people who are watching these videos to try to understand, I'm just going to put this this line back here because this is sort of incomplete because we need, we need to see how what this line is. But we do know that when we make this November 9th, we're actually looking at November 9th, July 18th. Depends which line we're looking at, but we, we can take these and make these the first day of the first month, and this is the 10th day of the seventh month, the Sunday law. But this 10th day of the seventh month, the Sunday law, is not the Sunday law on the big line. That is, we're zooming into 9-11 as the arrival of the second angel to create these other lines. So these lines aren't all drawn out. Now, people are wanting me to, and, and we're going to be able to do it with the book of Judges, um, to take these lines in our history and see that they're actually in the book of Judges. So, of course, that's our morning studies. That's not what we're doing here. Um, but I'm trying to figure out how much we should do as far as um, in this series of studies, uh, bringing in some of these other lines that we have had. So... So I'm not really sure what the answer to that is. I, I, I probably need more feedback to know what's going to be useful for people. It's always the problem with uh, Zoom. You have a lack of feedback. Um, I have some people saying that, you know, what they, they find about how we switched 9-11 to 11-9, that that was really helpful. Um, but how much we understand from that, it's hard to say. Now I'm going to, I'm going to go to the whiteboard here and spend a lot of the time, 45 minutes, um, discussing this, but so. Okay, so 
I know there's lots of repetition here, but we, we sort of need it. If we're going to understand how these lines are connected, So we have this darkness. Okay. Sorry about that. I'm just trying to get this straighter. Okay, so here we have this darkness. We know we have these way marks. So we're just gonna put the first, second, and the third here. And we have 1844. And we have October 22. And we have April 19th. Okay, so this is the arrival of the second, second angel's message. This is the arrival of the third. And then over here, we have the Sunday law, the loud cry, and the close of probation. Now, since this is the arrival of the third angel, as we've done many times, the third angel arrives and continues. It's joined by the second angel of Revelation 18. And then it's going to so you got this angel coming down, and it's going to join, and it's going to swell to a loud cry. And then you have the close of probation, right? Ellen White took this midnight cry. Let me just put this here. Um, and she, she said that this midnight cry parallels the loud cry, or the loud cry parallels the midnight cry. This is Millerite history. And this represents the Sunday law. But when we put it in here, as we've done many times, we have this second angel being 9-11, and we have this being 11-9-89, right? Right. Okay. So when we do that, we end up with a midnight cry here. So this midnight cry, which also parallels this midnight cry, can't be the loud cry. So when Jeff put the midnight cry, well, he didn't put it here, but he recognized it. And Ellen White says that we're going to have this loud cry in the close of probation. Initially, Jeff is going to have this loud cry parallel this. But later we have a midnight cry that precedes the Sunday law. And that's always been a problem. But what we understand is that we have zoomed into this way mark, which is Revelation 18, and we have created this other line, 9-11, midnight, midnight cry, Sunday law, that is not on Ellen White's line. What she has is she says there's a repeat of Millerite history, then the Sunday law, and then the loud cry. But in our repeat of history, we have a midnight cry that does parallel the loud cry, just as this midnight cry parallels the loud cry. Can we see that? So this line is a separate line, but it is a zoom into the Sunday law of Revelation 18. So we put Revelation 18 being fulfilled here at 9-11. So I, mean, I know I've done this many, many times, but every time we do it, we start to see more detail. We start to see what it is that we are doing. And 
what we wanted to try to do in the next number of studies is really understand our lines. I really want to understand when we take 9-11 and we say it's the arrival of the second angel. Uh, Brother Theodore? Yeah. The 11-9 you got at the first angel, right? Yeah, this is November 9th, 1989. Okay. I thought um, I thought nine eleven came before eleven nine. Not nineteen eighty nine. Oh, okay, okay. I'm sorry. You got that as eighteen nine. Okay. Yeah, nineteen eighty nine and two thousand one. Okay. I just I just put it there as an eleven nine because it's it's yeah. I think you understand now. Yeah, I do. Yeah. So we have this Revelation eighteen, the angel coming down at the Sunday law. In Ellen White's line, but in our line, that angel comes down at 9-11. So that means that this Sunday law of Ellen White's contains the repeat of Millerite history. It contains this. And so that means this midnight cry that precedes the Sunday law is just the repeat of Millerite history. But we had often looked at the repeat of Millerite history as being well, the loud cry parallels the midnight cry. So that was one of the justifications that we could originally, before we had 9-11, that we could just say Ellen White is paralleling these two. But now we have another midnight cry in our history that precedes the Sunday law. And so we have to understand that. So even when we look at this line here, we know that this, 9-11, is not the arrival of the second angel in this line. This is the empowerment of the first. And this is the arrival of the first. And this is the second angel arriving. Can we see that? Yes, we can. Okay. So the second angel arrives at the Sunday law. But yet we have a second angel arriving in our history. That's because we're taking 9-11. This history here is just zooming into this single way mark, which is the arrival of the second angel. And so that means 9-11 needs to be the arrival of the second angel. Because this is the Sunday law. So... One thing is we can see we're in the time of the Sunday law. The Sunday law, in a sense, is not future. And we know the actual Sunday law itself is future. But at 9-11, the Sunday law arrived in this line. Because this line is the Sunday law. The Sunday law is a history. It's not just a single day event. Can people agree with me on that point? Can people understand? Yes, what? it's it's oh, graphic. Man. Okay. Now, and, and we can see that Seventh Day Adventists, as this history unfolds, the repetition of the first and second angels' messages, um, they're going to be caught unawares when this Sunday law comes, because it comes in this progressive manner and they become accustomed to what is happening. That is, they're failing the tests all along the way, right? And they, they always are going to think they're passing the tests. Whether they're conservative or liberals, it doesn't matter. People believe that they're, that they're okay because they think they know what the Sunday law is about. And yet they haven't fully understood it. Now, this is what A.T. Jones is showing us in the studies um, from the 1893 General Conference bulletins, that the Sunday law is much more complex than people think, because it's really about character. It's not about knowledge. It's not just knowing what is coming, it's having the character that can survive what is coming. 
and people think that just knowledge is going to save them. But we are actually being prepared by the reception of these messages to be able to stand in that time. But we have to stand now as well. We can't just wait till that time. So I think this is becoming clear, and, and it's been the morning studies that has been helping me to see this more clearly. Um, even though we've been studying it for a long time and, it, and it's slowly being pieced together. But this is the most important thing that we would need to understand about these lines, is that we can zoom into a waymark and we can have another line and that we can have a waymark that's or an event that's a waymark in one line can be a different waymark in another line. So we did have a line where, you know, the first angel is empowered at 9-11. So, so this line here where we have this is the first, this is the second, and this is the third is different than this line where we have this is the, uh, the empowerment. These two 9-11s are different 9-11s. They're different waymarks, the same 9-11, but they're different waymarks in different lines. And so this movement, as we continue to, to move in our history, we, we came into this waymark that was the arrival of the second angel. And, that, and we can use this, this waymark that's 9-11 we can use it connected to 11.9. And that's what, what we're going to try to figure out in much more detail next Sunday. Any, any questions about this? Because hopefully this is making sense to people. These 9-11s and 11-9s become extremely important. Okay. <clears throat> People hear me okay? Five by five. Now, uh, I just want to touch on one other thing, which is not really particularly related to these lines, but it's interesting that Stevens uh, posted a, a diagram which um, somewhat relates to this because we were dealing with August 11th, 1840. And um, so this is on WhatsApp. Many people will have seen it. And what we have here is, is something that's uh, an expansion of something we already know. Um, this is a period of 1,533 days from August 11th, 1840 to October 22nd, 1844. And there's 186 days, if we just do a cardinal count, from the first day of the first month in 1844 to the 10th day of the seventh month in 1844. Now we often call it 187 days because that would be uh, an inclusive count. Ordinarily, it's the 187th day of the year is October or 20, it's the 10th day of the seventh month on the Jewish calendar. But if we say an ordinal number in a cardinal terms, that's an inclusive count. So 187 days, is, which is ordinal, which is the ordinal count expressed in a cardinal count is an inclusive count. So we call it 187. Now we know that July 18 is of course symbolized by this 187. And um, so we also know that the 187th prime number is 1117. Now, 11 times 17 is 187. 
So it's it's one of those interesting details. Now, what Stephen has done is he's looked at the number of days from August 11th, 1840 to um, April 19th, 18, 1844, and noticed it's 1,347 days. And the 1,347th prime number is 11117, so 11,117. And so that's quite remarkable that uh, we can take the number 187 and it's going to be uh, the 187th prime num number is going to be um, 10,000 less than the uh, this other 1347th prime number. Now, what it, what it particularly means in relation to the lines that these are analytical aspects of a line. And when we do this, we're analyzing a line um, we're in a sense measuring it. We're, it's a measuring line after all. And so these spans of time can have meanings related to the dates. And so this, this is a pretty remarkable uh, uh, coincidence if you wanna call it a coincidence, it's God's design. It's not something that likely could occur by chance. Um, now the seventh prime is 17. Uh, symbolizing the seven times that end on October 22nd, 1844, Iran says. So uh, so the seventh prime number is 17, right? The first prime number is one. Uh, the second is two. The third is three. Uh, five is a prime number. Seven is a prime number. 11, uh, 13, and 17, right? One, two, three, five, seven, 11, 13, isn't that the, the eighth prime number? One, two, three, five, seven, 11, 13. Isn't 17 the 18th prime number? Eighth prime number, I mean, Iran? Um, I'm sure it depends, it probably depends on how you count, but that's what it said when I looked it up. It better was okay. the seventh. Yeah, so sometimes there are different ways that people count uh, prime numbers. And, and I'm not sure why um, why that is. But uh, if I, I'm just going to do something here. So I'm going to do. Yeah, so it says it's the seventh prime. So um, I'm just, I know this is. Maybe they're not counting one as a prime, but I would think it would be. That's what it sounds like. Yeah. Yeah, they're having two as the first prime. Okay, so I wouldn't have counted them that way. But I know different people count them differently. So that's the way uh, they're counting it. So they're not even counting one as a prime number. Okay, interesting detail there. So um, so hopefully anyway. That's close. part of the statement. It's part of the statement. Yeah. What what is a prime? A prime is a is can be divided in by one and itself. Right? Yeah. So one is is not even a statement. So that's why they count from two. Yeah, but I, I was always taught that one one was the first prime number. <laughs> so I guess I was taught something wrong in school. Wow, that's pretty amazing. Okay, so just to close this up. It's uh, all about a point of view. Yes, but this is how it's standardly done. Right? So this is a standard way of looking at it. Okay, so uh, we're, we're going to close with prayer. And I want people, of course, to be praying for uh, the camp meeting coming this summer. Um, uh, there's lots of things happening in this movement. And um, so... Uh, and also for these studies here on Sundays, that uh, they'll be productive and helpful. Let's close with prayer. Dear Father in heaven, thank you for the study this afternoon. We just pray for your spirit to continue to work upon our hearts. And thank you for the things that you are showing us. Help us to understand these lines in, uh, in a way that we can present them simply to others. 
and um, we pray that uh, we can represent your character in doing so. Bless each person and bring us together again to study your word is our prayer. In Jesus' name, amen.